The original Buttercream Gang is one of my favorite stories on film. It's so uniquely bizarre in its home movie aesthetic, combined with the attempt to teach kids about gangs in the most ignorant and ineffective way possible. I asked you to live with us because I thought you'd be a good example for my children. Now all they talk about is being in a gang like you. So I was, of course, very excited to check out the sequel, The Buttercream Gang and the Secret of Treasure Mountain. I mean, what a title. That has all the promises of a classic kid's adventure. Talk about a shift from the original. That was a very grounded story about gangs, bullying, and what to do when your best friend goes through a Robert De Niro phase. Don't you ever talk to me that way again, do you understand? Look at me. This is gonna be wild. I can't wait to see what they... Oh my god, it's so boring. So, so boring. boring. It's somehow even more boring than actual church. We want you to have a safe and sane and wonderful New Year celebration. And New Year and life. How dare they call this the secret of Treasure Mountain? There's no secret. Everybody knows there's a treasure up there. They've known for literally ever. I've spent many a summer day looking for that lost treasure as a boy. And do you know what the worst part is? Pete doesn't show up once. They don't even say his name. What the fuck, Forrest? Michael Weathered carried the last movie. How do you not bring him back for this? Dude clearly likes acting. He had a bit part in Mulholland Drive, and he played a guy named Chicago Pete in a movie about two friends who grow apart when one joins a gang. Huh. The rest of the cast isn't strong enough to keep this franchise going. I know it's mostly kids, and they were just there to have a good time, but they all suck and I hate them. Yeah, you know it. In the first adventure, we followed the leader of the gang, Scott Carpenter. <laughs> this one shifts the focus onto Eldon Flowers. Eldon is supposed to be the dunce of the group. You might not have noticed it in the first film because the writers have no idea how to time jokes, but it's clear that the gang sees him as a stupid moron who can't do anything right. What's the matter? I think somebody broke into Pete's house. You sure? No, oh, but I left Eldon there to watch. Eldon? Could you see me sending him for help? That's a good point. I promised him a giant milkshake if you just stayed there. What's my milkshake? In this film, we learn that the gang's constant bullying has given him an inferiority complex. He desperately wants to be a hero, but always gets upstaged by Scott. Now, there's a few ways to establish this conflict. You could have Scott outperform Eldon in a fundraising competition. You could show how Scott constantly gets the glory even though Eldon does the tedious grunt work. But the kid-friendly team at Feature Films for Families decided to do this. Dad! Stop the boat! Help my little girl! She's twisted in the road! Oh, get her! Help! Somebody help! Save her! Stop the boat! Oh! Now it is a bold choice to open your Christian kids movie with a little girl nearly drowning to death. Honestly, I want to see the alternate universe where Scott couldn't save her. And the rest of the movie is the gang trying to process the trauma of watching a girl die on beach day. Looking back on a younger man, long ago and far away. Living in an age of innocence, in the shadows of a brighter day. Time stood still and it never seemed that our worlds could grow apart. It was all for one and one for all, straight from the heart. Many years ago, Mary Poppins taught us. <laughs> Anyway, this scene establishes Eldon as a self-absorbed asshole. I'd like to be the hero instead of it always being Scott. The obvious progression here is to have Eldon learn that doing good is its own reward. Even if he does manage to do something heroic, getting tons of praise for it pretty much ruins the point of the story. So how does this movie end? It's the curse! No! You saved my life. This is for Mr. Graf. I've always been rich. So the plot here is that Mr. Graf is being forced to sell his house because he's broke. 
And gee, I can't imagine how that happened to such a responsible business owner. Don't you get it, old man? You're being robbed here! Well, I know that's what you're trying to do. But if I give you the money, then you're not robbing me. It's one of those movies that makes capitalism the villain, even though it doesn't realize that's what it's doing. The whole premise is really weird. This rich couple wants to buy the house just for the sake of having it, even though the dude clearly hates it. This place has, uh... Uh... Termites? That's not even a difficult problem to write around. The house sucks, but Graf owns a lot of land. Just say the guy wants to build a mini mall or some shit. Then you get the added tension of Graf feeling obsolete because everyone is excited about getting soft pretzels and a hot topic. So naturally, the kids decide to help out by searching for the lost treasure. Well, technically they were already looking for it because Eldon found a piece of the map earlier. That looks like an old document. A very old document. If we unwrap it, it could come apart. It could be a map. A treasure map. Or it could be a, a Grateful Dead poster. Whoa, somebody smoked weed in college. Driving that train, I'm cocaine. So the other parts of the map are owned by a monk who randomly lives in this 90s town, and this bald dude with a ponytail. As it turns out, Mr. Ponytail's ancestors placed the treasure there several years ago, and now he's come to reclaim it. But he doesn't deserve the treasure, because he really wants it, and that means he's evil. And that's basically it. The gang looks for a treasure, the bad guy wants it, Eldon saves Mr. Ponytail's life, and the town is so inspired by his heroism that they all pitch in to save Mr. Graf, which is something they could have done from the very beginning. But we're not done yet. There are still a few things I want to talk about. For one thing, I owe the creators of this franchise a deep and heartfelt apology. In my last review, I made several remarks about the film being racist. A very courteous commenter pointed out that I was way off the mark. Get your facts straight. This is not a Christian movie. It was made by Feature Films for Families, a Mormon company. I think you are reading racism into this movie that isn't there and turning a wholesome film into something ill-intentioned. Mmm. Mmm. So humbling. See, I just assumed Mormons were Christians because they worship Jesus Christ, but despite that being the exact definition of Christianity, it, ju it just ain't true. More importantly, I never once considered that the filmmakers didn't intend to be racist. I thought that using stereotypical imagery associated with Hispanic gangs, referencing Hispanics as the primary source of gang violence, and having Pete switch to his mother's maiden name as a warning sign that he was into some bad shit, Evaldez. were all deliberate racial commentaries. But that's not what they meant to do, and therefore, none of it is racist. And if you thought they were racist, well then explain this. That's right, not one, but two people of color in this movie. And these kids aren't just in the background, oh no. The creators are so not racist that they make sure you are very aware of them every time they're on screen. I think Ellen just got himself into a precarious situation. Precarious? He's gotten himself into a circumstance dependent upon chance, risky, and insecure, uncertain, unwarranted. He's about to do something goofy. <laughs> I mean, they play no significant role in the plot. You could remove them from every scene and the movie would be exactly the same, only much shorter. But putting two kids of color in very noticeable but unimportant roles in the sequel to your film discussing the dangers of gangs with an all-white cast really goes to show that you're not a person who sees color. And really, if we as an audience are paying attention to such things, aren't we the real racists? Yeah, you yeah. know it. I mean, damn, they even have representation for indigenous people here. <laughs> All right, it's time we talk about Scott. Scott, the protag of the last movie, the leader of the Buttercreamers. How have we gone this long without saying more about him? Well, for one thing, he's barely in this movie. His most prominent scene is one where he loses a race to a girl because, you know, gotta show off how cool she is. I like girls. I think the equality of sexes is inevitable. But this scene is totally pointless and we don't hear much from either of these two ever again. One thing we do learn, however, is that Eldon has a lot of pent-up resentment towards Scott and has numerous fantasies where he cucks him. 
I don't think it's a secret that I hate Scott. He came off as a self-righteous prick in the last movie, and I feel pretty vindicated because the sequel seems to agree with me. Scott acts like a total ass for most of the film. He's completely oblivious to Eldon's self-esteem problems, and he and Lanny have no problems shitting on him for his failures. Told you not to invest in that dumb lemonade stand. You should have pulled together with me and Scott and done the races. Well, I guess I can't be as perfect as you guys. Thankfully, Margaret is back for this movie, and as the designated mom of the group, she's always there to provide the emotional labor Eldon needs. Eldon, I think you're already a hero. You're nice, you're funny. Look, my mom always says that real heroes are the ones that help others without their knowing it, and without all the praise. Wow, I think what we just saw there is a perfect example of getting friendzone. What a fucking beta bitch. Do you need a tampon for your vagina, madam? You may have her respect and admiration, but you're never gonna land the princess if you keep acting like a clown. We do not need to create more of those men. Or should I say men, because like, they're not men, they're not masculine, they're like, disgusting. High key masculine men would never show their weaknesses to the public, and therefore would die before ever appearing to be a victim. Join me in my fight to make beta males extinct. As bad as Eldon came off in the beginning, he's actually a pretty great dude. Despite his jealousy issues, he's consistently kind to everyone, and he does it without even trying. In the first movie, all of the Buttercreamer's good deeds felt performative, like this was something the adults expected from them, and you'd be seen as a pariah if you didn't spend your weekend mowing Grandma's yard. Eldon is just naturally kind. There's one scene where the kids set off to look for the treasure, but as they're about to leave, Eldon's uncle shows up and tells them that Mr. Graff is going to paint his entire house today, which really isn't something he should be doing since he just had a heart attack. Scott and Lanny decide finding the treasure and saving Graff's house has higher priority, and they tell Eldon that he should come with them because this is his chance to be a hero. And even though the authority figure in the room also gives his approval, Eldon still decides helping a sick old man is more important. This is probably a good time to talk about the film's religious message, which, shockingly, is almost non-existent. All we get is one parable from the monk which Eldon doesn't even understand. It's honestly pretty amazing. One of my biggest gripes with Christian movies is their insistence that you can't be truly good unless you know God. And while Eldon is for sure a Christian, his actions are driven by his own empathy and compassion. And sure, being raised in a religious family may have influenced him, but I think it's safe to say his kind nature wouldn't just disappear if he stopped believing. To be clear, I'm not rooting for Eldon to renounce his faith. My point is that a belief system does not make anyone inherently more virtuous than anyone else, and I appreciate that the story here focuses on showing that Eldon is kind, rather than trying to explain why he is. I really liked Eldon. He's my favorite butter- No wait, Pete exists. He's my second favorite buttercreamer. The only problem is that he doesn't really have a character arc. You'd think that his need for recognition would make him more selfish, but he always does the right thing even when he has no reason to. So the only way for him to grow is to find self-worth in doing good for its own sake rather than recognition. But in the end, the only reason they're able to help Mr. Graff is because Eldon saved Mr. Ponytail's life, and he's so grateful that he spends all of his gold coins on a glass of lemonade. Eldon gets to be the hero he always wanted to be, and doesn't learn shit. Okay, to be fair, he did have to sacrifice the treasure in order to save Mr. Ponytail, so I guess their logic was, even though Eldon thought getting the treasure would make him a hero, doing the right thing still mattered more. But if that's the idea, maybe the stakes shouldn't have been, you know, a human life. Could you imagine if Eldon came back down and was like, Hey guys, I got the treasure! <coughs> yep, and all I had to do was let a man fall to his death. Weirdly, it feels like the point of the movie is for everyone else to realize how great Eldon is. And I can't totally disagree with that. Scott and Lanny never really valued what he brought to the team. But the moral doesn't really work in this context. With rare exceptions, we identify with the story's protagonist. We don't relate to the random townspeople who buy lemonade at the end. So what we're left with is a feeling that, if we're nice, then everyone should be more grateful for us. And that totally ruins the original point of Eldon needing to learn the value of good for its own sake. At the start of this movie, his disappointment at not being the hero overshadowed his relief that a girl didn't die. And that's not a totally unrelatable feeling. People want to be admired. And in a time where heroic exploits are broadcast to people all around the world, it's easy to feel like our small, uncelebrated accomplishments are meaningless. 
But Eldon doesn't learn to appreciate the value of things like helping a sick old man or caring for a kid that got hurt. His actions ultimately lead to him doing a big important thing and getting the fame he was looking for. The original Buttercream Gang managed to be great in spite of itself. Pete's story is a remarkably poignant depiction of what it's like to grow up and realize that idyllic small town life is a lie. The world is complicated, and when everyone around you pretends that it isn't, you end up looking like the crazy one. What's the matter with you people? Don't you got any brains in your head? The Secret of Treasure Mountain is a better movie in that they manage to keep a consistent tone and tell a simple kid story with a protagonist that's actually likable. But in the end, that only ends up hurting it. The weird factor made the original fun. This is just a bland story that offers nothing, and it makes me sad. Partly because I was looking forward to this, but mostly because Michael Weathered was cheated out of what would have inevitably been an Oscar-winning comeback. Somebody find this guy and get him in front of a camera. He was born for this. And so ends the original era of the Buttercream Gang. As far as I know, there are no other films in this series that have the charm of amateur filmmakers doing their best. But Joseph Smith is a generous god. The legacy of the Buttercream Gang lives on in a secret third movie. But that is a story for another day. Where's my notion? Just once. I'd like to be the hero instead of always being disgusting. Disgust, 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 disgust. I've always been rich. I've always, I've always, I've always been rich. I've always, I've always, I've always been rich. Where's my notion?